Peace and blessings to everyone. Yes, brother. How you doing? Same to I'm you. I'm doing great. I, I give all praises due to the Most High, and I greet everyone with ancestral greetings um, from myself, my ancestors, and all of the palaces that I, um, I represent on my behalf. And um, I appreciate this beautiful forum, and I'm happy um, to see everyone together learning and reconnecting about our culture. So what actually pushed you to decide to find your, your, your trap? Uh, well, from a young age, I was already um, always interested in Africa, um, being a teenager, you know, going to the library often and learning about different African civilizations and culture. And I grew up Muslim, so I was always around um, people directly from Africa. So I was very connected to Africa and I wanted to know where I was from. Um, but even before I knew where I was from, I always saw myself as an African. You know, and I was always connected and wanting to learn more about the culture. I just didn't know which one to primarily focus on. So I would just study them all and, you know, just connect with different ones that spoke to me. Um, around 2009, 2010, I wanted to really find out. So there's a company called African Ancestry that traces your maternal and your paternal lineages um, where you can find out. Um, what present day country and tribe you share ancestry with. So I knew about it for quite some time, but around 2000, you know, 2009, 2010, I decided to actually, you know, put the money together and take the test. And I tested my mother's side and my father's side. And I found out that it traced back to uh, Cameroon, the Bamaleki tribe. So once I found that out, I wanted to know everything I could find out about the Bamaleke people, everything. I wanted to be as connected to my tribe as my ancestor was, if not more. So as soon as I found out my, my heritage, I, like, I was in college, you know, community college at the time. So all of my Cameroonian friends, I, I just started talking to them more, started joining associations and um, just anything that I could do to just immerse myself in Cameroonian culture, I was just all for it. And in that process, um, I came across um, the Northwest Fonds Council USA, and that is a collection of fonds and notables from Cameroon who partially reside in the USA. Mm -hmm. um, they had recently did... Um, a ceremony with art jammers who went to Cameroon. I wasn't able to go to that. And there was an elder who, for health reasons, she wasn't able to go to that particular ceremony. So they decided to have a ceremony in the United States for her. And um, in that process, they, they asked if there were other people who wanted to also participate in um, this naming ceremony. And um, I was one of the people that also um, signed to um, participate in it. So the Northwest Farms Council arranged the naming ceremony with myself and others. They invited different um, fawns and chiefs from directly from Cameroon. One of them was the fawn of Batu Farm. He consulted, you know, his his oracle and he was guided to come and um, I appreciate him arriving there. I, I believe his. Um, niece or, or um, relatives also in this um, Zoom meeting as well. So I'm very appreciative of him. I took a great picture with him. We look like father and son. And um, during this uh, naming ceremony, I was given the name Quinny, which means love in Bamaleke Feifei dialect. And the um, kingdom of Bakanji, they welcomed me and they had people from Bakanji there, um, particularly the Gamini family. And um, Andre Iken, who's like my godfather in Okam, he's also from Baboni and um, Bakanji. So my um, Okam family is, you know, Bakanji. And then also I have um, Baboni um, people too um, that's connected to me in um, Okam. So that, that really was like the um, foundation of me um, connecting with my Cameroonian roots. Um, but as as time progressed, I started just noticing that no matter where I went or what I was doing, I was always connecting with 
people from the Northwest. It seemed like everywhere I went, there was a, a T card person and just, I, I just really felt so connected to the T card people. And there was a sister who mom uh, was the one, uh, her name is uh, Sister Regina and she received um, a name at the ceremony as well, along with her mother, very powerful sister. And for some reason, she um, sent me this um, letter that had, cause she went to the hotel, she was in a hotel and all of these notables um, that were from Bank Kim and t Car Plains visited her and gave her their information. For some reason, she wanted to give that to me. And um, at the time, I didn't know the connection between um, the Northwest and t Car and Bamaleke. So I was like, I'm Bamaleke, why, why does she want to give me all of this t Car information? But, you know, I accepted it because she's an elder, so I accepted it. And I just put it away. I didn't even look at it like that. I just kind of put it away. And I looked at it like once or twice. And it showed me it had the number of the king of Bankim. And it showed that he was the grandfather of Bamaleke, So Kingdom, and all of the uh, Tikar descendant um, nations. But, you know, I, I would just look at it occasionally over the years. Never paid attention to it. Um, so fast forward, I finally went to Cameroon in 2015. I went twice that year, um, both times staying like three weeks, um, like um, Prince Ilona was saying, you know, you really have to stay for multiple weeks to really kind of absorb the trip. Um, so I went to Cameroon in 2015 and um, during that trip, um, I met the fawn of Nso. Um, Dr. Um, Emmanuel Fai, who is the highest um, ranking so notable in the USA is the one who arranged that trip for me. He's a big brother and a mentor, as well as, um, again, uh, one of the biggest notables um, in So Kingdom. Um, so Kingdom is not a Bamaleki kingdom. It's a Tikar descendant kingdom that was founded by a princess from Van Kim. Um, and um, Dr. Dr. Fai is also a member of the Northwest Farms Council. Um, and him, just like the other fawns and notables in, in the council, they really helped groom me to know royal protocol and different cultural um, things that I should know. So I met the, the fawn of So, and he embraced me as his own son and made me a prince of So kingdom. Um, that's something I kept quiet for years about. I didn't really tell many people. And um, he also gave me the name Linzele which means how long has it been? Um, for several years, I, you know, I was a soul prince, but I didn't really tell anybody, you know, and then finally I, I requested, let me have a soul name so I can kind of broadcast it more to everyone, you know, and um, unbeknownst to most people, you know, uh, there's a certain ritual that if you're a fawn, you have to do something every so often. And while he was in that process of doing the ritual, you know, he came up with the name for me. And it means how long has it been? And if anybody's familiar with um, what's happening in the Northwest and Soul Kingdom, it's just so much um, importance with that name. So he embraced me as his son. And again, this relationship with, in Soul Kingdom has been since 2015, but most people are kind of knowing about it now. Um, and when I went to Cameroon, it was just really such a beautiful experience. I love Cameroon. Um, when I went there, it felt like, you know, when you're from somewhere and you've been gone for a long time and you go back to your hometown and you just realize the buildings look different. That's what it felt like when I went to Cameroon. It felt like I was just going back to where I was from, but the buildings look different. I, I knew 100 percent that this is where my ancestors were from. And just, it was so spiritual when I went there. There were times where I had to remind myself that I was really in another country. I literally felt like I was just at home. Like I didn't even feel like I went anywhere. And um, I love Cameroon. It really has become a part of me, like my own legs. I love it. Um, Bamenda, I, this is pre-crisis. I was in Bamenda. I love Bamenda, just a beautiful place. Um, the people of the Northwest are just so beautiful, wonderful people. I met a lot of good friends there. Um, my wife is from there. Um, just, I love it. And I even, you know, of course, Duala, like um, Brother Prince Ilona said, Duala is a very special kind of place. You got to 
have a special heart to love that place. Um, but I love it. And and um, I went again, same year, 2015, for a second trip and saw more places and loved it even more. Um, you know, I, it's so much I could say because it's, it's been over really like a decade of reconnection with Cameroon. So I can really kind of go all over the place and talk about various parts of it. But if you had any particular questions, I can kind of, you know, stare it in the direction that you would like for the um, people to hear. Oh, thank you. I mean, that's a really amazing testimony. So uh, it's lovely. So anyone has uh, got any question or anything? I prefer to let anyone else speak, you know. Anyone got a question, they can, you can go ahead, guys. I have a question. How was it for you in terms of language? Do you have any language barrier when you came there? Um, not at all. Um, one thing about me, one of my gifts is that I pick up on language as well. You know, um, I, I speak languages and sometimes you can speak a language to me and I, for some reason I can understand it sometimes. But no, I didn't really have any problems. Um, in the Northwest, of course, they speak English and some Pigeon English. And um, I know a little bit of French, but everyone that I've been around when I was physically in Cameroon and when I would go to, say, an OCOM um, meeting, because um, the, the OCOM community have associations here in the, the Maryland, PG, you know, Washington, D.C. area. And when I would go there, of course, they know that I'm from America. So they would speak a combination of Fei Fei. French, and then they would always have somebody translate it um, in English for me because they they knew that my speaking of the language was limited. So I, I didn't I didn't really have much of the the language barriers just because of my love for languages. Um, but um, Cameroon really is bilingual, and when you're in the French speaking part, you know it's expected that you know French. And some people they will kind of. Uh, push the French, but when they really know that you don't understand it, then they'll speak the King's English perfect. Um, but um, no, but to answer your questions, I didn't really experience too much of the language barrier, um, especially uh, being in the Northwest region um, where I spent a lot of time at, but, you know, in Francophone communities and in that part of Cameroon, I always had somebody that could at least speak English to translate it for me. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you and I, you know, we spoke quite a few times in the past, but I would like to know why did you uh, keep um, you being a prince a secret for so long? Um, well, because I wanted to connect with my culture because I knew that this was something that belonged in my family. You know, I felt that I felt like in America, until I knew what part of Africa I was from and who I was, I wasn't really being my true self. So my intentions with taking the DNA test and connecting with my culture was just about being who I was. I wasn't seeking um, royalty or any type of praise. Um, I just really just wanted to be my, my African self. So, you know, getting my name from, you know, the Ocom community from Seoul and then of course Ban Kim now and all these different places and being welcome into these communities and finding my cousins and you know just being a part of just where I felt as though my ancestors got robbed to me that was always my intention and um, just being around the Fonz Council you know with them really grooming me with the culture I understood that you know princehood kingship Royalty in Africa means responsibility. So it's not about um, the praise that come with being a prince or being a chief or a king. It's about what you can do for your people. So I felt I've always felt that I can actually be who I am because that's what it's all about for me. So being a, a prince or a notable, it's about helping the people. So I can help the people without necessarily telling them prince. Or, you know, I, I can do it all without necessarily advertising it because I didn't want to um, push that so much because that wasn't so much my intention. But over a period of time, I've gotten more comfortable with it. And just, you know, when you're around people and, and you know, especially when the fawn gives you a name and they announce it to people and, you know, it's kind of like, OK, I have to 
show appreciation. So I have to let people know like, okay, this occurred, this happened, you know, because keeping it quiet is almost kind of like, well, we did this for you. Do you not appreciate it? You know, so I wanted to, you know, I got comfortable with being more open with it over a period of time. Um, you know, I just felt that it was more important to just be my African self and to serve out the responsibilities of the role without advertising it. Um, but now I, I advertise it because I'm more comfortable, you know, saying it to people. Makes sense. Yeah, you know, and um, it's it's a beautiful thing, and um, and and also, I think what made me feel comfortable with it was it was when my son was about to be born. Um, my wife, uh, my beautiful, amazing wife, who I appreciate, she's letting me do this interview with our while she's watching the children right now, and I appreciate her. Our, our children are very active, so I I, I want to if my wife is listening, I just want to let her know I appreciate her very much. Um, you know, when we were having the baby shower for my son, um, the fawns, um, who, who stay over here, they, they all came and for the baby shower. And I had a conversation with one of the fawns. And this is when I started understanding that when you sit on the throne, when you're a king, you know, you, you see the world a little bit different from the regular person. You know, something happens during that enthronement where they communicate and they see things that we don't see from a spiritual perspective. He spoke to me, he talked to me, he said, um, he said, um, when we seen you for your naming ceremony, you know, everybody was saying, okay, you're Bamaleki. He was like, I saw more than just that. And he said, when I looked into your lineage, he didn't elaborate. This is what he said. And I just agreed with, you know, I agreed with him because I knew he was speaking from a certain place. He said, when I looked into your lineage, I, I looked at how, because he was like, I'm just amazed at how you're able to go from palace to palace. And you were able to marry, you know, a princess and everything like that. And he was like, when I looked into your lineage, I saw that you come from a palace. You know, and that's why all these palace doors open for you. You know, this is quoting him. This is um, and actually it was Fawn Gonjo from Injiron that told me this. And, you know, I, I have a lot of love and respect for him. So when he said that, I said, you know what? I have to represent this a little bit more. To me, that was my signal to start putting it out there a little bit more. So I started telling people more about it. Um, but when the fawn of and so and then the fawn of Ban Kim, when they gave or the king of Ban Kim, when they gave me um, you know, my names and titles and things like that, I felt like, okay, now I have to kind of put it out there for the public. Um, but um I just love it. And just the culture is what I love a little bit more than um just that that's 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 what drove me to everything and I got the culture, I got the connections with my people. I love it. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Anyone got any question? I had a question. Um, Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Um, so, so since you finally became more comfortable with sharing, you know, um, you know, being the prince, how have things changed for you since then? As far as like, you know, not just you personally, but when you're sharing, like have people's responses been different or how they, how they treated you differently since you come out openly? Um, well, I think that, I think if I had to pick one thing that has changed, I think it, I think it's something that's a little um, less tangible. I think when you tell people, and it's not just myself, you know, there's, other people who have been welcomed um, into the palaces, um, like, for example, um, my cousin who is um, on um, the Zoom meeting, she's a queen mother and a princess. And of course, Brother Tukam and um, Prince Ilona, you know, these these are all people who have titles just like I do. And I think that when people like ourselves, you know, um, advertise it and, and let it be known, um, it, it lets the public know. And when I mean public, it shows the diaspora that we are welcomed into Africa, you know, cause there's this perception that, you know, Africans don't love us or, you know, they don't see us as African or they're anti this, anti that. But when someone has made you a prince it means that you're, you're now my son. When someone is a queen mother, you know, these are titles that people from Cameroon don't get, you know? So when, when these 
palace's doors are open to us, it, it signals to the rest of the diaspora that we really are welcome. So it really makes us custodians of the culture. And it, it really just, um, it promotes the culture and it promotes the diaspora to want to reconnect more. Um, so of course, when you reconnect, it shouldn't be titles that you're looking for, but um, people like myself and others who have these titles by people who seeing these things and, and, and seeing these ceremonies and seeing the pictures and reception, it, it, I think it ultimately encourages others to reconnect with Africa. Even if they don't necessarily get these titles, it, it will at least open the door of curiosity and making them feel comfortable with knowing that our brothers and sisters from the continent do love us and they do want us to come back home. And they love us so much that they'll do even this much for us. So I, I think that that's the one thing that happens when um, people like myself, you know, make it known that we have these titles. That was well said, brother. Very well said. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just uh, another thing I just want to share, um, just the spiritual aspect of all of this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the one sister, Regina, um, when she gave me that paper, a paper that I would just, I would move different places. And, you know, I kept that paper for years and years. And I finally looked at it. And when I, when I really looked at it and I thought about, wow, she saw something that I didn't see. Because, um, of course, I'm, you know, my, my forefathers come from Bamaleke and, you know, I'm, I love being Bamaleke. And um, of course, I love my Bukonji Okon community, the Ingamini family and the Ikin family of Baboni. I love all of my Bamaleke people. Um, but as time progressed, I learned that Bamaleke came from Tikar. Um, my first Okon meeting, um, this one brother may rest in peace. You know, he gave me um, the, a rundown of the history. Um, Bukonji came from Bapacha Ingala. It was started by Bapacha Ingala Prince. And... Bapacha Ingala, just like Bamaleke, you know, many Bamaleke people, we came from the Tikar people, you know, so I knew that. And then as time progressed, um, when I was um, made a prince in Seoul Kingdom, that was started by Princess Ngonso from Ban Kim. And then when I look at the fact that I'm Bamaleke, I have my name Quinny, that means love. My children have that name as their surname, and that's going to also be added on to my actual legal name, Quinny. So that Quinny has now become my family name. So as long as I keep having children and they have children, you know, they won't need any more DNA tests in order to Bamaleke because the name Quinny will be there. And um, when I look at, you know, being welcomed into both Ban Kim and, and so I see just the journey of my ancestors because Ban Kim, you know, is the foundation. And on that paper that the sister gave me, that's what it said. It said, um, His Royal Majesty Ibrahim God II, the grand, the paramount king of the Tikar, the grandfather of Bonso, that we now know properly as So Kingdom, and the Bamaleke. I was like, wow. And I looked at part of my journey. I was like, wow, ain't that something? I'm connected to all three. You know, and Gonso from Ban Kim started in So Kingdom. And, in, you know, in So Kingdom, you know, I, I have connections with both of that. And then Ban Kim is also the home of the Bamaleke. So it's just, um, that's what you see with my names. Linzele, that comes from Inso. Monchanon comes from Ban Kim. And of course, Quinny comes from Okong. And I just, I just truly love it. I love every bit of it. And it's just to see that connection and how it all played out, you know, unintentionally on my part. It shows that this is God's work that's happening for all of us. Every last one of us. When we go back to Africa, Cameroon, Nigeria, wherever you go back into, this is something spiritual because they tried to, when I say they, I'm talking about the colonizers, the oppressors, and this is not to promote racism, anything like that, but it's just a historical fact. When the Europeans entered Africa, you know, through their different methods and, and swains and, and things like that, they kidnapped us and their intention was for people like you and I to never exist to be forever disconnected from our culture. 
So after they tried every single thing that you could think of to dehumanize us and to rob us of our culture, look at us. We're back now. We have our ancestral names. We know where we're from. And not only knowing where we're from, we there's people we've taken so many DNA tests where we know almost every village we're from. You know, um, I even found some relatives in Cameroon. I found people from Banjoon that are my cousins. I found people from Bafut, Mankin, all these different people. This is what they tried to take from us. So I just want to say that with this reconnection, just remember, it's not just about you. It's not just about you finding out where you're from and, and it becomes like this little, uh, you know, picture that you show everybody to say, hey, I was there. You know, this is about restoring your lineage. This is about repairing what was taken and, and making sure that future generations don't need to take a DNA test to find out where they're from. You know, so this is all it's about for me. It's about the journey of being who I am, being who my ancestors were and being able to give that to my children and move forward, you know, all the generations ahead. And I love it. Wow. That's awesome, brother. I mean, like you say, uh, only one person needs to take it, and then that goes to everyone coming after that. So that cover <laughs> everyone, all your children, your grandchildren, and everyone coming after you. So which is amazing, you know. So uh, mm. anyone else got any questions? So we can, before we can move on to the next speaker. I have one question. Go ahead, sister. Peace, cousin Quinny. Oh, peace. And Bwani, and Bwani Mafu. Thank you. I, now that you know who you are, I'm familiar with your journey for dual citizenship and the work that you've done for and toward that. Do you see that happening in our lifetime? If so, why or why not? You there, Quinny? Hello, brother Quinny. Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead, Prince. No, I couldn't. I couldn't hear her question. If uh, it froze. I said, moment. I said, I'm familiar with now that you and I know who we are. We know who where our family comes from, where we hail from, and I'm familiar with your work toward um, dual citizenship and your petitioning for that. Is this something that you think will happen in our lifetime, that being granting dual citizenship to those of us who descend from Cameroonians? I believe so. Um, but I think that the method um, to go about it is going to be a little bit different from how it is, say, with um, Sierra Leone. All right, like, for example, um, I'm a part of an organization, United House of Ancestry, um, you know, Mission of Hope and Deliverance. And, you know, we partnered up with um, KE International. Um, to, to build smart cities um, in Africa. Um, so part of that, I'll be based in Cameroon uh, for you know a, a period of time helping with development of various places. Um, in that process, I'm going to try to find ways where you know you talk to the people you know who actually have the power to do it. Um, I believe that it can happen, but it's going to have to take it's going to have to take us being directly in Cameroon, talking to the right people. Um, no disrespect to anyone at the embassy. I have only good things to say about them, like most people will. But <laughs> I'll just say that um, I think that the Cameroonian government will have to see the benefit in um, granting dual citizenship to the diaspora. Right now, um, I see that even to native born Cameroonians, you know, that's not extended yet, you know, and you and, you know, you and I know that native born Cameroonians send tons and tons of cash back to Cameroon to the relatives, who you know, and building, you know, businesses and land and stuff. So I think that um, with the right conversations, talking to the right people, you know, and, you know, us being Bamaleki, we're smart, you know, we talk to the right people and allow them to see the benefit of giving dual citizenship to, um, you know, people from the diaspora. I think it'll start with maybe people like myself and you and, and um, uh, Prince uh, Tukam and um, Prince Ilona, people like us that, you know, maybe if it starts with, you know, small groups of people, I think it can eventually grow. Um, 
but yes, but to answer your question, I, I think it will happen in our lifetime, but it's going to have to take the right people to talk to the right people to make it happen. Yeah, that's a good answer. Definitely. Thank you, cousin. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. And, uh-huh. and um, let me just let me just say this to um, uh, Brother Monkum. When you get a chance, I think you really also need to speak to um, my cousin, um, Mafu Ducey. You, you have to speak to her, too. She has an amazing um, story as well. And um, she does so much to help people. And, and like I say, she she's behind the scenes. But I, I like for her to, to step out to the front and get recognized. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. And he's, he's a little partial being my cousin. I second, I, I, well, he's I, a little I'm, partial. I'm not, a, I'm not our cousin. I second that as well. <laughs> she definitely has a story. She definitely has a story to tell. Definitely. Yeah, and her story is on both sides of the continent. You know, um, you know, she she's just a magnificent sister who has done so much for our people, both when it comes to reconnection, when it comes to just the, the family, everything. She's wonderful. So I don't want to put it all out there. I, I'll save it for when you interview her. But, you know, <laughs> she, she has done a lot of great things in variety, you know, and all of us like at a level of excellence. So, you know, I, I appreciate her personally for what she does for our people. And um, I think you will as um, you will too. Modern day Harriet Tubman. Modern day Harriet oh. Tubman. <laughs> thank you. Definitely, definitely. Tubman. Thank you, cousin. Y'all definitely. I love you so much. Yeah, thank love you. Too, yeah, I'll definitely take so and then we can get arranged. Uh, I mean, in terms of dual citizenship, I think that what we can do, we need to speak to you. Um, Professor uh, Amadou, he's based in Cameroon as well. So he's going to be able to, like you say, you need to speak to the right people. He's going to be able to connect us with the right people. If you need to have a petition and write something, you know, sign something so he can take you over there, we're going to, we need to have a meeting and then we can actually uh, get that sorted. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think? Yeah, I think so. I, I definitely would like to speak with him. And, you know, and again, you know, um, just when it comes to dual citizenship, um, one of the things that I will say is that um, just with everything, when it comes to reconnection, we have to come humble. We have to come with the olive branch. Um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with uh, the movie Black Panther, right? You know, that Killmonger type of thing where, you know, people kind of come demanding. I think that that's not going to work, especially in Cameroon, because um, if ID... A F was a country, it would be Cameroon. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Cameroon really doesn't care. You know, um, they not they don't care about tourism. You know, like with them, you have to really come humble. Like I think that with the government, we can't come demanding dual citizenship. It had to be a more humble, more kind of maybe backdoor approach where maybe, like I say, maybe some individuals would get it. And the Cameroon government see the benefit in it and maybe they'll extend it to others. Um, but I just don't see just from being around the Cameroonian community and just the vibe that I get. I, I don't see them doing widespread, you know, kind of mass dual citizenship like Sierra Leone. I don't think they just want to let anybody sign up. Oh, you, oh, you got roots. OK, come. They not. I don't think they're going to do it like that. But individuals who, you know, who have come properly come with respect you know, and they see a benefit in giving it to us. And, you know, um, I think that'll happen. So like I say, people like myself, you and others who, you know, who might have a little bit more, of, you know, we, we, we might have a better case than somebody who just says, hey, I, I just took my DNA test. And if they come in, you know, trying to demand it, I think if, 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 it's, a, if, it, if it's done, you know, a little bit, you know, in, in that manner, I think we'll get a lot further. And I say that because, um, in 2010, um, Art Jammers went to Cameroon and that was brought up um, about dual citizenship. And, you know, anybody from Cameroon knows what the following means. Oh, we're, we're going to have a meeting on it and discuss it. You already know what that means. That, that's the Cameroonian way to say no. So, of course, this was <laughs> over a decade ago and they have not resumed. They haven't told us the results of that meeting, a.k.a. no. So they're not going to do it like that. But, you know, again, individuals might get it. And then over a period of time, you know, two, three individuals become 15, become 20, becomes others, you know. But the Cameroon government has to see a benefit in it. They don't see a benefit in it. 
um, you know, they're, they're not going to do it. Okay. I mean, I think with uh, the model of humanity getting built in Cameroon, and then you got the, you got BNBR as well. So UNESCO is, is taking over. So they're going to be renovating the whole BNBR. So with them to uh, development, it can actually trigger the government to look at the impact of tourism. And then that can actually uh, go back to probably consider that they may have maybe not given the job, they may have a special status in the common government where they can actually, you know, kind of like uh, welcome a uh, brother and sister back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. Now, we're speaking about the uh, citizen, uh, dual citizenship. Do you think the reason why they're not giving it to us is because they're, they're afraid of the the voting and the, the the elections and presidencies and stuff like that, would it be easier for them to give it to us if we said that we didn't want to have anything to do with the elections or voting at this per period of time and just let us just come home and just reinvest? We still get all of, like the benefits of being a citizenship, we, a citizen. We just don't partake in you know, you know, the uh, uh, you know the the government type things. I think that's a great selling point um, because um, like, for example, like Liberia, I have some relatives um, who live in Liberia, who are from Liberia. Um, as you know, Liberia was um, founded by, you know, newly freed um, Africans. And um, some of my relatives are, you know, are the ones who went back and, you know, let's keep it real, they colonized Liberia. And um, part of what Liberia um, went through was, um, Liberians abroad would um, have that citizenship and they would come back and, you know, run for office. So part of the dual citizenship thing that they're going through in Liberia is, OK, if you get dual citizenship, you can't run for public office. So I think that with Cameroon, I don't know if it would be a fear of theirs as a, it, my personal opinion. I think that right now it's not there because the Cameroon government, you know, right now is not something that they care about. It's not something that they feel like they, sh they should care about it. You know, I'm not saying that they're wrong or right for that. But I think that, again, if like people like myself and, and, and you and others, if, if, if that's part of the discussion, you know, with talking with the right people and say, OK, part of this dual citizenship is that, you know, we're not going to run for public office and try to use our resources and wealth or, you know, or perceived resources and wealth. Um, to try to run for office and things like that, you know? So I think that's a good selling point. But I think that part of the reason why it's not there is just because they don't really see any benefit in it. Again, there's native-born Cameroonians who, you know, who, who, who don't get it. So I just think that, you know, if they were offering it to native-born Cameroonians and they didn't want to give it to us, then I would be like, yeah, maybe there's something to it. But I just think that the, the Cameroonian government, I just think that at the moment they haven't, um, been convinced that it's something that's necessary or beneficial. And I think that if the right people talk to the right people and show that there's a benefit and with presenting it, present it in a favorable way that they'll be inclined to want to grant it. And I think what you just said is something to keep in mind. You know, when you when you talk to the right people like, hey, we're not trying to become the new Paul Beer. We just want to be able to, to come back home and be citizens. You're right, and, and don't hit us with the taxes when we start a business. Don't. <laughs> I think, I think if that's part of the conversation, that'll work. I think the you other way around. I, I, I disagree. I'm if I'm going to be a citizen of any country, I want my vote to count in that country because I'm not just going to accept anybody. Oh yeah, the vote yeah. over me in my life in in, in, in a country. Oh yeah, my fault. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't have. I don't have, I don't have any political aspirations personally. But I, I still would, uh, if I'm going to be a citizen, I, I would still like to be able to uh, make my voice heard in the country that I'm a citizen of. Yeah, you know? I missed that part. Yeah, my fault. But yeah, I agree. Yeah, we should <laughs> be able to vote. Yeah, but I think that, you know, just that clause of running for office would probably, you know, make a lot of countries, you know, be a little concerned because the perception is if you're from the U.S., you know, even if it's not true at all, but the perception is that if you're from the U.S. or the U.K., you might got some kind of resources and stuff like that. But, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. be able to vote. Yeah, I agree with that part. But just running for office, that's that's the part for some reason I focus more on. But, yeah, running yeah, for I think office, I misspoke. That's what I was trying to say, run for office, because I believe 
uh, Paul Bia took the uh, dual citizenship away because somebody from the UK who was a um, Cameroonian by uh, by blood or by birth or something, I'm not sure, but he made it illegal because of something like that. So I, I don't have a problem with giving up running for office as long as you don't hit me with the taxes and treat me like an outsider when I come there. That's all. It was Aijo. Aijo took it away. It was Aijo. It was there before. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the easy way and the other way around, I mean, if you got any kids or involved in sports, they can actually get the common citizenship. We've got a sister, she never been in Cameroon before. And she, I mean, she's in a Cameroon uh, basketball team. She was born in America. She was referred by her friends. And then she was, she, she, she got the citizenship. The only time she went in Cameroon, when they was playing the Afro basket in Cameroon. So she went there for the first time. So if you if you if you're involved in sport and you know anyone doing sport, your family they can easily be recommended to the Cameroon uh, Federation and then they can easily get the citizenship. I mean you got footballer who never been in Cameroon before, but they they was born in Germany, they play for the Cameroon national team. You know, so there, there's way around, there's a way around, there's a lot of way around. Yeah, and I'll say with Cameroon, just like any part of Africa, you know, there's always an exception to the rule. And again, you know. You know, some things are not always to be, you know, publicly mentioned. Like, you know, it might be somebody right now with dual citizenship, but we never know. They're quiet about it. You know, some things with, with, with you know, not just Cameroonian government, just Africa in general, it can be done, but it's not always what you do is how you do it. You know, and all within the, the framework of the law, of course. You know what I'm saying? But again, you talk to the right people, you know, at the right time about the right thing, you know, and, and you have good intentions with it and is and is um done legally and is done within favor of the law and um everybody see the benefit and in, in something getting done, it can happen anywhere in Africa. So there's always an exception to the rule. That's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah.